Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison McKittrick, and I'm the Outreach Librarian for the Betsy B. Creekmore Special Collections and University Archives at UT Libraries. Happy Ask an Archivist Day. Um, Ask an Archivist Day is a wonderful opportunity for people to learn more about who archivists are, what they do on a daily basis, and their thoughts on the profession. So today we are talking with our fabulous archivist at the UT Library Special Collections. So first we have Alicia Schumar. Alicia is the assistant head and university archivist at Special Collections. She oversees over 4,000 linear feet of university archives and she builds collections that are key to the UT community. Prior to UT Libraries, Alicia worked at the University of Pittsburgh as the archivist for the Frick Collection. Alicia earned her MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh. Next, we have Chris Bronstadt. Chris is the modern political archivist for Special Collections. She is also the liaison librarian for political science and sociology. Originally an English major from Texas, she has a master's in information science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. While a student there, she worked as a reference archivist for the McCormick International Harvester Collection and so for a short while was conversant and tractor. I love that detail, it's great. Um, we also have Laura Romans, who is the manuscripts archivist with Special Collections. Laura builds, maintains, and promotes the use of all manuscript collections at UT Libraries. She holds her MLIS from the University of South Carolina. And prior to working with UT, she worked on the South Carolina Digital Newspaper Program. So hi, everyone. Welcome. You guys ready to answer some questions? Yes, OK. So, Laura, I'm going to start with you. Um, one of our questions um, was, what path did you take to get into this field? Sure. Well, as an undergrad, I was a history major and um, I had a work study scholarship. And they put me in the special collections and archives uh, at my undergrad institution. Um, and so that was sort of how I learned that it was even a field, that it was something to do. Um, and I just realized that I really loved working more hands-on with history. Um, and so I learned a lot while I was in that position. I worked on a lot of interesting collections um, and then worked closely with the archivist there who um, sort of just told me about, you know, going to get your master's, that you could get it in library and information science, you could focus on archives um, and special collections. So I did that. That's how I ended up at the University of South Carolina. And while I was at USC, I just tried to do um, as many different types of internships and jobs and volunteer work as I could um, in different settings and um, just sort of kept really enjoying working in archives and special collections at an academic institution. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up here. That's great. Thank you. Um, Alicia, what about you? What path did you take to get into this field? Well, I really had a similar path as Laura did. I started as a history major in my undergraduate, and I started with writing a research paper that I use our local uh, university archives for, and then I figured out that that could be my main job that I was doing. So I applied for a job um, as a student worker and started working there as a freshman and then continued on through grad school, went on to the University of Pittsburgh and got another assistantship there where I worked in the archives. And I was to Chris's uh, tractors, I had coal culture and how you mine coal. So that's a pretty big industry in Pittsburgh, especially. So I knew a lot about 
how you manufacture coal, <laughs> but um, it was always fun trying to learn new things about the collections that you're working on. But yeah, I started as a history major and then fell in love with it. Great. Yeah. Um, similar stories we hear a lot. So Chris, what about you? Yeah, my story is is quite similar, um, but it was uh, before I had declared a major, my brother and my sister had also worked at the LBJ Presidential Library in Austin. And I was the last of us to to start working there. Um, and somehow it, it clicked with, with me. They went on to do other non-archival things, but I stayed in the working in the archives um, for um, many years um, uh, and then decided to um, go to, to, to school for it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I got here. That's great, that's great. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that about your family. That's pretty interesting, that's cool. Okay, so um, second question here. I think, um, Alicia, I'm going to ask you this. Why are archives and special collections important to a college library? Well, generally, I like to say that's in a library, it's what makes our collections unique. Obviously, we are collecting rare, one of a kind primary um, resources that you're not going to find in every library. So we do things a little differently. Some things are very unique. Uh, we digitize, try to make a lot of that open to everybody. But at the heart of it, it's what makes us different from the other libraries and other college libraries across the country. Um, Laura or Chris, would you add anything to that? Okay. I mean, I think it's also like, sorry, a, a lab um, opportunity for for history and English um, students, especially, but really any student on campus to be able to engage in um, in research that helps their own, you know, you can sort of see how history is played out in these primary documents. Um, a lot of um, undergraduates um, get uh, really excited when they see year university yearbooks from like the 1920s. Like that's that's what it, that's what our lives would have looked like back then. Um, I think it just makes learning just come out come alive in in some ways. Well, and I'll jump on what Chris said there too. Like coming from a teaching background, you know, I love teaching history, but getting to actually you know, touch it firsthand and research something that maybe somebody hasn't seen in a hundred years is just a completely unique, different, fun experience if that's what you love. So getting, you know, I was always amazed. I'm like, I get to, I get to just come in here and touch these things and research and, you know, see these things that haven't been seen or haven't been outside of an archival box in years. And, you know, it was just, it was a really fun experience. It, would, it took history from the books to the physical object, almost like a museum. Yeah, we are very lucky. <laughs> we get to work with these materials, absolutely. Um, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna move on here to Chris. This is our third question. If there was one thing first year students um, should know about us, what do you think it should be? I think that it should be that we exist, that the archives exist and that, um, they are um, more than welcome um, to to use our materials. In COVID, that might look a little different than it, during when we don't have a pandemic going on, but we still have a lot of digitized um, materials um, that that can be used for research projects or just understanding the past. So that we're here and we're here for for first year students um, would be the the big takeaway. I'd hope they get. Uh, Laura, what do you think? I think I would add on to Chris's answer by just also saying um, for students, 
a takeaway would be to think outside of the box um, in terms of what we have. So I think sometimes students think that maybe we just have a few things like, you know, really specific interests, um, but our collections are pretty vast. Um, so I guess I would also say, you know, not only are we here, but um, we have a lot of material uh, that can be used in a lot of different ways. So um, that's another thing that we can help them with is if they come to us, um, you know, just come to us with a question or an idea and then we can try to figure it out together. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Alicia, what would you add? Well, I found the archives in my freshman year, first year. And so I think that is something um, that can really help you out in your subsequent years. Um, knowing what the collections that we have can kind of drive what you're trying to do with your different classes. And for me, being a history major, writing the papers that I was writing, I got to do unique types of research that I wouldn't have known if I didn't know what was in our collections. And so um, I think that was a fun, although very eye-opening experience. You know, collections can be much larger than you think when you first start as a freshman, but um, it was really fun and, it, and it, it helped me through my subsequent years to write those better papers. Yeah, all of that is perfect, yes. I'll just okay. add one. Yeah. Um, I, we love to know that the students know this in their first year because we hate to hear them in their freshman year coming to special collections and saying, well, I wish I would have known this has been here the whole time. And so that's the one thing that we're trying to get out with our marketing and with our collections and digitizing our materials. We're here. You know, if you're ever just wanting to know what's in the collections, we have all of our finding aids online, um, easy to search. And so we hope to get to you early on in your career, but we're always happy to have anyone that comes in the archive. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I was going to say, I might just skip forward and say, um, you know, what, um, how can students learn or see more about special collections if they're not on campus this semester? Um, Alicia? Why don't you just keep going? Yeah, on well, like I was saying, about. yeah, we, um, we really try hard to digitize a lot of our materials since they are unique and rare. Um, and a lot of times you can only get them here in special collections, the most used or the most unique. We scan them or digitize them or make them available through our digital collections. So you'll find a lot of our unique material available there. Like Chris was saying, all of our yearbooks, um, since I'm the University Archives, especially we have our athletic programs that we're going back through all the sports and digitizing those that people really like to look at. Um, we have some of our, um, you know, manuscripts and modern political archives that we're digitizing and making available so that people can get to that and they don't have to come into the reading room to access our rare materials. But we're also available, um, the archivists ourselves are available through email um, throughout the pandemic to set up times and talk with you about different collections or even getting you access and scans to the material that you might not be able to um, come in and do yourself. Yes, absolutely. Um, Laura, Chris, would you add anything onto that? Other ways that um, people can access or look at some of the things that we have? I'd just like to, to say that it doesn't hurt to ask to reach out to um, somebody in special collections, um, one of us, um, and, and just see um, what, what we can tell you, um, uh, how we can answer your question. So um, even if you think, you know, you might not have something about this particular subject, we might, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Also, we might be able to find an archive that does. So if we don't have it, we have some good contacts to figure out where else they might be able to find it too. Very good point. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we had a question here about McClung Museum. Chris, um, do, do we work with McClung Museum? Do y'all work with McClung Museum a lot? 
We do. Um, we have similar goals to McClung, McClung being the museum on, on campus. Um, so, you know, they're a museum, we're an archive, we, we both um, collect and make available um, different kinds of objects. Um, the, the formats that we collect are a little bit different. Um, uh, so we work with them to, there are some overlapping um, collections that we try to place in the right in the right place. Does this belong in a museum or does it belong in an archive? Um, we also have uh, shared outreach goals. So um, you know we would like to work with them um, about uh, how we get a message out to the public, how we can how our collections can complement each other's. Um, so if they're having an exhibit, um, well, what do we have in our collection? that might complement that. So we, we do work with them um, quite a bit to, to make that information more available to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alicia or Laro, do you have anything to add to that? Well, you can, um, what question we usually get to with the museum part of it is what, it, how is an archive and, and a museum different? Um, since we have a lot of the same collecting goals and obviously preserving history, um, it, it was like Chris was saying, traditionally the formats are a little bit different. Archives would generally collect the, the paper manuscript and not maybe the object as much or the artwork, but now those lines are kind of meshing and we're working together for shared collecting and preserving goals. And, you know, if they're, like Chris was saying, if they're having exhibits or we're having exhibits in the library that we can share that material, make sure that the public gets to view it um, in a number of different ways. So it isn't just they have the artifacts and we have the paper. It is really that shared um, collecting goal. Yeah, we love McClung. They're great. Um, okay. Uh, Laura, why would special collections slash archives want family heirlooms like old photos and letters? Well, first, I think um, I want to touch on that. Um, you know, a lot of times people think if people even know what an archives <laughs> is, um, then they usually do think about um, at a university that our library would have the university's records and be the university's archives, um, which is true and is, of course, a very crucial part of what we do. Um, but we do also collect um, and preserve things related to um, just, you know, the culture and the history of our area. Um, and so that does come from the personal papers of people, of families, um, local organizations. And, um, you know, family heirlooms are some of the most uh, unique things that there are. Um, and so people's letters, diaries, scrapbooks, photos, um, even if maybe they don't feel like they were necessarily, um, you know, they weren't famous or they weren't super influential. Um, but their material can really give insight into a specific time, a specific place, a culture. Um, and so, you know, those are definitely things that we love to have. I think it also just kind of speaks to, I don't, you know, a part of human nature, like we all, um, maybe not all, but a lot of people <laughs> uh, tend to, um, you know, react more to seeing, uh, you know, a family scrapbook versus, um, you know, reading old newspapers or something. Um, people like to kind of see that personal side of history. Um, and so that's definitely something that, you know, we like. Um, and especially if it's, you know, a family that has collected material over the course of time. So over many generations, that's also really cool to have and can be a great research tool for people to sort of see how things have changed or stayed the same. Um, so I think I like to think of personal photos 
um, personal heirlooms as sort of like little microcosms of history um, that then people can use either on their own or to supplement, you know, other research that they're doing with maybe some bigger, um, more kind of like mass produced things. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Um, uh, Alicia, Chris, would you have anything to add to that? Well, I could just add to that um, kind of from the current perspective of what we're looking at. I've gotten a lot of questions on what was campus like back in 1918 during the Spanish flu. And so we have the local student newspaper and you know, we have some letters from students that were going home or, um, you know, not on campus or, or joining the war effort at the time. And so it really does sort of tell the tale of what was happening both on campus and in Knoxville uh, during the Spanish flu. So, and that story can help us sort of understand maybe what we're experiencing today and how students are experiencing it. Obviously they weren't taking Zoom classes back then. Um, it was a little bit different experience since there was the war effort going on. And a lot of the male students had um, were not on campus at that point. So we had uh, a larger female population and homecoming was um, canceled the year before. And so it was a lot of the sporting events um, as well. So we've seen things like this before and it, but the student experience um, and them talking about how they were, you know, sad that, their favorite things were canceled and maybe they didn't have the same experience that they had in years prior, but that, um, you know, that they were helping out with the war effort, making bandages and masks actually in the live in a room in the library at the time. So, I mean, it's, it's a really kind of unique experience to look at that and look at the efforts that everyone has put in currently and how that they're very similar. Um, and the students experiences are very similar, even though, we have all this technology now. Yeah, that's a great specific example for sure, for sure. And it actually is the perfect segue into the next question, um, which is, this is for Alicia. Um, I understand that the UT libraries and other libraries in the country are gathering and archiving our communities' experiences of the pandemic. How does that fit within the archives' mission? Well, yeah, um, what I like to say is that we don't wait until history is made to uh, record it and archive it. And so things that are happening today are historical. And so that we have to make sure that we're, you know, gathering that information from, like Laura was saying, that microcosm of history. Well, for me, it's our campus. You know, we didn't have that many letters and, and student um, responses to the Spanish flu. So I knew at the onset of this pandemic that I really wanted to make an effort to capture the campus community's um, feelings and viewpoints about what was happening so that, you know, people could look at this down the road and say, oh, well, I really have a really good perspective on that. And so what we did was create an easy um, form, a couple questions that ask the students, staff, and faculty how they feel, how they're coping, how their home life is, how is it to take all your classes online, um, are you going to take a gap year, different things like that. And they can also submit their creative work. So we've had students um, submit artwork and poems that, they, that help them um, kind of navigate what they're feeling during this time. And so I think that is going to be very important for us to have, you know, 100 years from now. Um, and so we have over, we have a couple hundred responses so far and we're still collecting them. We will continue to collect them. Um, and then you can also donate multiple times. We asked, we started that last semester in the spring, right on the onset of sending every, uh, that um, spring break when most of our campus community and students um, were asked to stay home with the shelter in place order. So, and we're gonna continue to um, collect that through the next year. Yeah, it's an important project, and we we very much encourage everybody to to um, share experience if you can. 
Right. Yeah. And your um, unique individual experience is important. Yeah. So a lot of people think like, nobody cares what I'm doing at home during quarantine, but people want to know. And that's the thing that I was asked frequently, what were people doing during the Spanish flu? And so I really only had the larger newspaper articles and public notices that were happening at the time, other than the few letters we had from our students, we only had about 500 students on campus at that point. So, um, you know, it was a little bit tougher. So that's why I wanted to make sure that we have this to preserve on into the future. So, you know, if you're staying at home, you're learning how to bake sourdough or you're doing things like that, that's a trend. People are going to want to know that um, and see how kind of how we're making it through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so Alicia, this is this question is to you um, as well. What is a question that archivists like to ask other archivists? Yeah, this is always a funny one. Um, when we, you know, meet in our, you know, our state conferences or in our meetings, um, this generally comes up in our annual uh, Society of American Archivists meetings, and that's what's the weirdest thing that's in your collection, or what's the uh, where's the weirdest place you've had to go to pick up a collection, and that can um, get the ball really rolling to know like, you know, I was in the bottom of a dumpster picking up this collection, you know, something that somebody threw away that they didn't think it was important but is vital for your for your collecting area, um, or I was in the you know the attic of a barn to pick up these you know, this family's papers. So that puts you into a, a lot of weirder situations that you never really thought you'd end up as an archivist. Um, kind of along, I kind of described along the lines of like American Pickers, the show on TV where they're going into old, you know, storage facilities and old houses and things are dusty and dirty and maybe there's a snake skin or two um, <laughs> in those collections. But uh, yeah, so that's generally what we talk about if we're asking about our new collections. A fun question. Yes, absolutely. And I was going to say, so Laura and Chris, you want to add as far as uh, something weird, weird that you have in your collections or the weirdest place that you have been to pick up a collection? Chris, why don't you, you want to start, Chris? I'm going to pick on you. Well, I've, I've been to... Um, uh, some tractor barns, not for McCormick International Harvester stuff, um, but uh, so nothing weirder than that. But I think my the favorite my favorite things that are in my collection right now, in terms of just uh, like weird objects, is a little um, vial of perfume um, or cologne, actually that um, Estes Kefauver, who was a senator from Tennessee, someone made for him um, as like a, a, a campaign novelty. Um, and um, we also have a lot, a lot of his hats. He wore a lot of hats on the campaign trail. So, um, and they're quite unique. So th those would be my, my weirdest objects. Yeah, I always think of him in that coonskin cap with his perfume on, with its this great. That, that was his um, signature in 1952. Yeah. Yes, this is great. It's great. Laura, what about you? Um, I feel like this is also, you know, one of those questions too where we can always think of kind of different things. It's like the answer depends on the day. Um, but one thing I was thinking about is um, we have a lot of collections of World War II veterans and they, um, it, you know, they kept, they picked up and kept a lot of souvenirs from their time overseas um, in various places. And sometimes they're a little strange. And one that I can think of right now is um, there, we do have a collection and it has a, the skeleton of a seahorse um, <laughs> in a box. Um, there's not really any information about it either. So um, I think that can also sometimes the knowing is weird, but also 
the not knowing. So not really knowing, uh, you know, where it came from, why they picked it up, why they had it, why they kept it. Um, so yeah, a skeleton seahorse. That's a strange one. That's a good one. That's and then great. making an enclosure for a skeleton of a seahorse is also something you probably never thought you were going to do as an archivist. So there's a lot of that too. Like, how am I going to store this unique object? So. Absolutely. Alicia, do you have a weird place or object? Oh you gosh, yeah. Add? I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there could be anything from like, you know, the materials that Dr. Bass has donated. And when we did his exhibit on his and he gave me one of his teaching skulls to walk across campus with and um, or tell us who Dr. Bass yeah. is. Uh, the uh, he is a world renowned professor in forensic anthropology and he studied decomposition and many other things. I'm not giving him his just due, but we have his research papers from um, all of the digs that he had done over the years. And so we've, we had um, the information on those remains that they had found. And um, so when we kind of talked about the life of his career, we did an exhibit. And so we needed some of the artifacts that are um, in the Bass building and within the McClung collection as well. And so um, uh, it was just fun to kind of put those all together. But the one we did recently with the 225th anniversary of the university, my favorite was the creepy smoky costume, the one of the first, the 1970s um, Smokies costume that we, everyone was sort of horrified but could not turn away from. Um, and so that was one of my favorite, you know, we would see students walking past the exhibit and they'd be like, wait, what is this? And, yeah, and so, which nobody thought was on at the time. It's super cute. It was homemade, um, but it was one of the first iterations of having our smoky costume here on campus. So kind of looks like a orange and white bunny costume that might give you nightmares. I don't know. Or you might love it. Who knows? So that was always a fun thing to put in the exhibit as well. Yeah, we love the smoky and hit the holes that go into the abyss of the eyes, right? That was... <laughs> This is great. Um, we had it on a mannequin before we put it into the exhibit and our student workers would come in to come to work and they'd be like, what? I thought somebody was standing there in this creepy costume. So yeah, we had to put that back in the box pretty quickly after we took the exhibit down. But he might come back. We'll see. We'll see. So this is great. All right. Um, so Laura, what does a day in the life of an archivist look like for you? Well, you know, um, basic caveat that, you know, every day is a little different, <laughs> um, which is one of the exciting things I think of our jobs is we do kind of get to do a lot of different things. But <laughs> if I have to answer, um, for me, with manuscripts, I would say the bulk of what I'm doing is overseeing processing of collections. So a pretty typical day involves um, working with some fabulous student library assistants, student workers, undergraduate and graduate. Um, and so just sort of working with them to process collections, um, whether it's we're kind of always doing it. So starting collections, checking in on collections, um, fielding questions about um, how to organize, what to do, what to do with weird things that they find. Um, I would say that kind of makes up the bulk of an average day. Um, but then, of course, we're all sort of um, juggling all of the other sort of added things that we're doing. So um, kind of other various projects that our collections may be involved in. So um, working with you, Allison, on instruction or getting ready for, you know, for a class, pulling materials for a class, um, helping with the reference question, um, working on a digital collection or a digital project, um, maybe working with a donor, you know, getting in touch, checking back in with a donor, things like that. 
that sort of those sort of little things kind of filter in throughout the day. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, Chris, what about you? Uh, it's uh, similar. Um, I I have a little bit of a different scenario because I have the this little area of collections, the Modern Political Archive, and I kind of do um, uh, reference for that, um, as well as um, uh, being the uh, political science and um, sociology librarian. So um, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, work for that as well. Um, but definitely it's it's about making the collections uh, available to people and making sure that they are kept available um, and uh, described in the right way so that we can, that researchers can find uh, what they need. Yeah, absolutely, great. Um, Alicia, what about you? Well, like, like Laura and Chris said, every day is kind of different. Um, while you do have a plan for um, getting a collection from, maybe picking them up from the, the donor's house or office to getting them to be finished into our archival boxes like I have behind me, um, there's a lot that goes into that. And so it's kind of like cooking a recipe that has a lot of things on the stove at once. And so we usually have a lot of things from starting preliminary inventories to, um, you know, processing collections, preservation, um, taking things up to our preservation lab and having um, repairs or special enclosures built for them. So it's always different and it's never boring. And you don't, I get tons of reference questions that I never thought that I would know the answers to. Uh, so that makes me really great at like just very random historical knowledge too. <laughs> so, um, but it's really interesting. And, you know, being it coming from a history background, that stuff is always really interesting to me to, you know, kind of search through the primary resources to find the answers for the individuals that are asking them um, and kind of tell that story. So I kind of look at it that we have a lot of things going on from day to day but they all kind of go back to the th what Chris was saying is making sure that we have the stuff available and that people can access it. I mean, cause that's our main job here is to make sure the stuff is safe and then make sure people can get to it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I feel like I'm always telling students, you know, librarians are more than just about shushing people, <laughs> like access, main concern. So, absolutely. Okay, so um, Chris, how has the pandemic affected your work as an archivist? Well, um, it's an interesting uh, question. I think that um, it's really made me more, um, even more cognizant of how important it is to um, provide sort of off-site uh, reference. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's a little, it's a little less um, comfortable for me in a way because I'm not by my collections every day. And I'm used to having that ability to just be like, oh, if somebody has a question about something, I can just go and, and see them. Um, I'm I'm now at a remove um, for a lot more of the week than than I'm used to. So um, it, it there really has become more of a focus on on making things available. Um, and for a time, um, I kind of slowed down on um, uh, getting in collections. Um, but I think, you know, I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable about um, bringing that back um, and, and uh, uh, growing our collections again, so. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Laura, what about you? What, what changes are you seeing? Um, like Chris mentioned, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is that we're not with our physical collections as much as we normally are. Um, whether that, like in her case, you know, mentioning um, to answer reference questions or research inquiries, um, but also just in, um, you know, how much we can spend on to process or the maintenance of those collections, um, which again is a lot of what I do. Um, so I think one way that we've um, pivoted within with the manuscripts collections is um, spending a lot more time to focus on the description of our collections. So we've been able to um, review our finding aids, all of our finding aids uh, that predate all of us, <laughs> many of them do. Um, so, you know, there are still some gaps there. Of course, we're not able to check them against the physical collection, but we can kind of give them some TLC in terms of um, little things like checking for grammatical errors or, you know, making note of things that maybe don't make sense that we'd like to check with the physical collection later on. Um, also doing a lot of um, language updating, um, making sure that our descriptions um, are accurate and inclusive um, of the collections that they're describing and the people that were involved in those collections. Um, so, you know, in a way it's been, um, it's, it's been work that um, hasn't been able to be a priority because we're doing so many other things, but, um, you know, we've been able to pivot and make it a priority now. Um, so that has been nice, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, but I would say that's one way. And just also thinking about, um, um, I think it makes us, just also a little even more aware and cognizant um, of our digital presence. And um, I think we were all there anyway, thinking about it, but now we're thinking about it even more um, and how we can increase that um, as we stay in a place of um, needing more digital presence and that that may be a trend. Well, it'll definitely be a trend going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. These are all big, big, big changes, <laughs> big effects. Um, Alicia, would you add anything to that? How has your work life changing, uh, been changing um, due to the pandemic? Yeah, um, it's, well, it's definitely changed, you know, like Chris and Laura is saying, not being close to your collections to answer the questions that you get. So you kind of have to compartmentalize what you're doing in a week um, more than instead of having everything kind of going at once when you're in the office or in the archive. Um, so that has been um, just a shift in the way that you kind of do your work from a normal day, like collecting up everything that you can do in the office and in the archives to do in you get the chance to come onto campus. And, um, but one way that I think it's interesting for me personally was when everything was kind of up in the air with the pandemic, um, working on the project to document what was happening, even though it was very much up in the air, um, kind of gave me some grounding. So I kind of actually helped me through all the craziness that was kind of going on during you know, March, April, and May. Um, Cause if I could do anything, I could document what was happening at least. And so maybe I didn't know what the next four weeks held, but I've had some sense of semblance of, um, you know, I'm doing what I, all that I can do in this moment, even though I'm at home. Um, maybe I can't do everything that I was doing on a daily basis, but this is something else that's important. And um, that will be an, that will be uh, something that we would want to see in the future. So that actually helped me through a lot of, you know, through the pandemic and through the social justice issues to make sure that um, from what the students are doing in that kind of outreach, that that is documented in the archives for future generations. So um, that was a good 
point of, you know, making sure I was here and grounding me through that kind of craziness uh, of the time and still documenting all of that too. So yeah, like, like Laura was saying, having to come up with things for our students to do remotely or in person when they're able to come in. Um, we really focused on Volopedia, which is our, um, encyclop our digital encyclopedia of the University of Tennessee. So we've been putting in new definitions, uh, new entries, new images to the um, current Volopedia. And so that's been really helpful since we've had questions from all over campus for uh, hundreds of different things that we can't get to um, if we're not with our collection. So we, every time we answer a reference to we create a new entry. So, um, so that someone can find that, you know, just through Google searching. And so it isn't something that you have to know that there's an archivist here collecting this that, hey, when I want to find this out, maybe I can just get through this through our um, digital presence as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the digital presence is the big thing now. And, um, and we, I mean, COVID's not going anywhere <laughs> anytime fast. So um, we'll continue to be developing that, I'm sure. So, all right. Um, and you all are all doing amazing work through this pandemic. I do just want to say that. Um, you guys are doing great. Um, okay, so last question. Is there anything else about the field that you think people should know? Chris, I'm going to start with you. If that's okay. Oh, geez. Well, um, I mean, I know there's a million things, but just anything right, that's just burning right. that you feel like you need to say. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this, but I'll, you know, it, it was based on something that Alicia was talking about before. Um, I can't remember if it was, uh, if it was now or, or an, another conversation previously, but um, we, uh, you know, we don't deal with just old things. Um, we are interested in, in continuing to document um, uh, the present and um, looking to see how to keep documenting um, with how, um, you know, people obviously use computers now to make, to make documents um, and not just word documents, but texts and uh, video files. So we, a, a large part of what archivists do is, is trying to ask, answer the questions of, of how do we capture this information how do we store it and how do we make it accessible to, to future users? Yeah, absolutely. Um, those born digital um, objects. Um, okay, so Laura, what about you? I think I would add um, that we also, for the most part, um, it of co would of course depend on where you work, but by and large, a lot of archivists are, um, we do wear a lot of hats. <laughs> um, and so just to know, um, you know, maybe for better or worse, but just to know that um, not only is it not just old stuff, but that we're also not just always um, processing or organizing collections um, that we, there is a space for a lot of different things. So if you're interested in, um, development, you know, building relationships with donors, um, if you're interested in instruction, if you're interested in social media, outreach, um, marketing, things like that, like these are all pieces of what we do. Um, and so I think, just something nice to know if for people that are interested in the field or, um, you know, that there's, it's pretty broad. We do a lot of different things. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Absolutely. Um, it, and I don't think people understand how broad um, the field is. So it's good. It's good. Um, Alicia. Well, I was one of those people that didn't understand how broad the field was when I started as a freshman working in a, in a university archive. 
um, I, you know, thought of all the traditional things of what you do to be an archivist, you know, picking up the collections, preserving, you know, doing preservation and um, processing it and getting it out and then doing instruction. So I did really kind of understand that, but there are parts of being an archivist that I did not know was going to be um, something that I did on a regular basis too. Um, you know, teaching is one thing, but then there's outreach and then there's all sorts of, um, like we, we've gotten added training in digital forensics and knowing how to code um, with a background for a lot of our finding aids at one point and some of our digital collections and how those um, are searched for and accessed through our catalogs. There's a lot. It is both very old things and very, very new things. So, um, you know, trying to describe what I do to people that might be, um, might not be familiar with the field. They're like, well, aren't you just sitting in a room, you know, working with old books? And, and I'm like, no, <laughs> not even in the least. I mean, some days, some days, sure. But most days it's a combination of everything. And, you know, it's talking to people about our collections. It's trying to think of things that we can celebrate and post through one of the, one of the university's many, many social, uh, social media channels and, um, you know, it's curating an exhibit, it's figuring out what the background, you know, figuring out what background information that we want on our touch screen exhibit. It's a lot of different things. But um, for me, it's something that I really enjoy. Um, you're never bored. I'm always learning something. I had no idea that I didn't know. And now I knew, now I know that I need to know that. So um, that's the fun thing about it. So I think, um, so you're not going to be locked away in a, in a dungeon somewhere processing collections. Um, but you will be doing a lot of different things. So if you're new to the field or you're getting into the field, that's what I would say is definitely learn the foundational skills, but also um, lean heavily into um, the new digital digital curation kind of um, track. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much for talking with us today. And I should let everybody know um, if you do want to get in touch with us at the TV Rick Moore Special Collections and University Archives, you can email us at special at utk.edu um, or visit our website. I see a little ticker going down there at the bottom of the page. Um, please visit our website. And if you have any questions, um, just email us. Um, and we'd love to help you in any way that we can. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Thank you.